Can you hear me now? You could probably hear me before because I have this mic, but they like to record it, so that's fine. So uh, now that I am remiked, uh, it's remarkable that I'm remiked, isn't it? <clears throat> well, this morning I want to finish that emphasis on on teaching and learning, not just to talk about hearing what the teacher says, not just about learning what they say, but about doing what God calls us to do. So that's that's where the emphasis will be this morning. Uh, and I think that it went one there. It's here, hear and learn and do. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you for allowing us to have this time together, and thank you as as the kids have gone back to school, and as we think in terms of school and and what school is for about teaching and learning, uh, Lord, I pray that whether it's public school or private school or home school or or just adults continuing to learn, that Father, we will think about who the great teacher is and what we can learn from you and how we can apply what we learn in order to live in a way that pleases you. So Father, as we continue and finish up our our teaching and, and learning focus, I pray that you will speak to our hearts, Lord, that we'll have ears to hear and a willingness to do exactly what you ask us to. These things, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our August memory verse reminds us that we're supposed to be listening to Jesus, and as we listen to him, to learn from him. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me or learn from me. For I'm gentle, I'm humble of heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's what we need to do. We need to learn. If Jesus is our teacher, if he's the one who's teaching, then then we need to be good students. We need to listen and learn. If Jesus is taking the time to teach us, that's what we need to do. If we listen to him and if we learn from him, then we're, we are well on our way toward getting where he wants us to go, and that's what's important. So we listen and we learn, but what comes after that? What comes after listening to Jesus, after learning from Jesus, after we get what he says and understand what he says, what, what comes next? Well, in that learning process, of course, we accumulate knowledge. We we get more information, we learn more things, we get a little smarter, a little more intelligent about what he wants, and that's important. We are supposed to listen and we are supposed to learn. We should gain knowledge, but, but is that all that there is to it? Is, is that enough? Is it enough to, to learn more, to know more, to know more about what Jesus wants? Is it enough? Well, of course, you know what my answer will be. No, that's really not enough. Uh, it's not enough just to get smarter about things of faith. God wants that faith built into our lives and pouring out of our lives. It's not just about knowing the right thing to do. In fact, it reminds me of the difference of what wisdom is. We talked last week about the difference between being smart and, and being wise. There's a difference. Smart means you know the stuff, and it's important to know the stuff. You can't, you can't be faithful to what God calls you to do if you don't know what he wants you to do. You've got to be in his word. You've got to study his word and know what he says. But wisdom is not just knowing what is right. Real wisdom is knowing the right thing to do and doing it. It's not enough just to know the right thing to do. We need to know the right thing to do and then we need to do it. That's real wisdom. You know, as I was thinking about that, about teaching and learning and, and then doing the right thing, a passage came to mind, and I'd like to really share with you from that passage this morning from James chapter 1. If you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to turn there because we're going to look at James 1, uh, and later we'll, we'll pick up Mark 9, uh, or Mark 10, sorry, but we're going to look at James 1 this morning and talk about some of the verses there. When you get to James 1 verses 21 through 25, you'll find that it, it says this in, in James. It says, therefore putting aside all wickedness and all, I need to turn to mine. I can't see it on that one very well. I should have marked it. You know, I marked, I marked my other one. I didn't mark this one. Usually I print it out, but I didn't do it and I should remember exactly what it says, but I fail sometimes. So uh, in verse 21, it says, putting aside all filthiness. I knew that was the word, filthiness. And all the remains of wickedness and humility receive the word implanted, 
which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. James 1, verses 21 through 25. Perhaps the key thing to learn in, in James 1, 21, 22, 23, it's what it says in verse 22. God wants us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. God wants us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. You know, as I look at especially uh, these, these verses, there are several key things that, that come to mind, uh, several key words that we should notice. So in verse 21, for instance, when it says uh, that, that we should uh, know the word and be doers of the word, uh, saying, therefore, putting all aside all those things in humility, receive the word, we need to understand what the word is. What's he talking about? Well, here in James, you find a couple of, of different references to, to the word. The word is called here the law of liberty. It's also called the perfect law. And from our August memory verse, we know that it's in part what Jesus teaches us, the truth that Jesus teaches us that we're to learn from. All of those things, God's word, God's truth, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the law. So it says that we're to take that law and, and we're to, to have it implanted in our lives. That's important. The word, the law, the instruction from Jesus, that's what we need to hear. That's what we need to learn. I like the way that James 1.21 puts it. In the, in the NIV, it says that we need to accept the word. We hear it, we learn of it. In NIV, it says we need to accept the word. I like the way that the New American Standard translates it. It says that we need to receive the word. We need to receive the word. That's, that's important. How many of you know that it's football season? Any of you know that? How many of you don't care? No, don't, don't answer that. Uh, football season. One of the things that we talk with football, we talk about receiving. How many of you know that in football there's a receiver? You know that? Okay, so... Uh, I'm not a great sports person, so if I don't get the analogy right, my guess is you'll figure it out. Do you know what a receiver does? Yeah, a, a receiver, you know, does, does the receiver need to know that the ball's going to be passed? Is that important? He needs to know, right? All right. Does he need to know the, the play? He has to be informed about the pass, right? So he has to know what's going to go on, and he has to watch the ball, right? So if the receiver knows it's a pass, knows where, where the pass is supposed to be, where the play is supposed to go, and if he watches the ball, is that enough? <laughs> oh, ouch. Uh, now, you don't have to be mean there. Uh, it is not enough to know that it's a pass, to know how the play is supposed to go, and to watch the ball. The receiver's got to run down there, be in the right spot, catch the ball, and then squeeze it tight so that nobody can shake it out of his hand, right? Isn't that sort of the deal? Yet he's got to hang on to it. That's what a receiver does. A receiver isn't a very good receiver if they just watch the ball and see it drop over there someplace. Receiver's got to receive it and then grab onto it and hang on to it. You know what? That's what we do when it says to receive the word. We receive it. We got to catch it and hang on tight. We don't want we don't want the, the devil coming and trying to yank it out of our hands. We've got to hang on tight. That's receiving the word. So James 1.21 says we need to receive the word. And James adds a description to that. He says we need to receive the word implanted. I really like that. Receive the word implanted. You know, when I think of implanted, I don't think of football. I think of going and, and buying a seedling or sapling. A little, any of you ever plant tomatoes or something? You go and you buy the plant. Uh, you know how it works, right? You buy it, you bring it home, and you find your place in the garden, you, you plant it in the dirt, or you put it in a flower pot, and you plant it. If you plant that, that little sapling, that little seedling that you bought at the store, if, if you plant it, if it's implanted, it'll put down roots, it'll begin to grow, it'll eventually bear fruit, if that's what it's supposed to do, or it'll flower for you. It'll just look. It'll do what it's supposed to do if it's 
implanted. If it's implanted. God wants his word implanted in our lives, implanted in our hearts, implanted in us. And if God's word is implanted in us, if it's in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, then it will grow and it will bear fruit for God and for his kingdom. We need to receive God's word so that it is implanted in us. Don't you like verse 21? There's some good stuff in that verse. And did you notice what it says? It says that if God's word, if you receive it, and if it's implanted in you, then what is it able to do? That word received and implanted in you is able to save you. God's word implanted in your life can save you. Now, hold on a minute. It's Jesus who saves us. It's not the Bible that saves us. So how is it possible to say that that God's word implanted in our lives can save us? Well, where do we find out about Jesus? Where do we find out that Jesus is God's only son, that he went to the cross and he died for our sins, that he was buried and for three days he stayed buried, but on the third day he rose again and he can forgive our sins and give us... Where do we find out about that? Well, we find that out from the Bible. When the Bible, when the word of God is implanted in our lives, when when we receive it and it's implanted in us, then it has the power to save us because the Bible is what tells us about God and his love, about Christ and his death for us, The Bible is what informs us, and if it's implanted in us and growing in us and developing in us, if that's what it's doing, then it has the power to save us and to give us that eternal life. So God's word, received and implanted, can tell us how we receive and then how we follow Jesus so that that we can be like him. That's how we are saved. That's how God's word can save us. So God's word received and implanted is able to save you. For God's word to do that, something has to happen, though. It's not enough to have a Bible sitting on the shelf. You know, uh, I have, any of you still have a big Bible on the coffee table? They used to do that years ago. Not very many people do. Do any of you have a Bible on the shelf that has sat there and not stirred a lot sometimes? Hmm. I have folks who say, oh, I need to get my Bible. It's in my car. I keep it in my car, so I'll have it on Sunday. You need it through the week. It's important to have it to be implanted in your life. For God's Word to be effective, we need to hear it. Not only do we need to hear it, but we need to learn it. Not only do we need to learn it, but we need to do it. If we're not doing what He says, then His Word is not going to be effective for us. God wants us to hear it, to learn it, to do it. And when we do what it says, and we do what Jesus says, then he takes care of the saving part, and the renewing part, and the giving us new life. When we do what Jesus says, when we trust him, then we'll follow him, and we'll go where he leads us. That is what we're supposed to do with God's word. So that's verse 21. A lot of good things, a lot of key words in verse 21. That takes us to verse 22. And verse 22 is all about following Jesus and And doing what he says. It says here that we are to prove ourselves. Don't be doers uh, only, but not merely be doers, not hearers only, but to be doers of the word. Prove yourself doers of the word. I like that prove part. Prove yourself a doer. Well, how do you prove that that you're a doer? How do you prove that that you're a doer and not just a talker? Some of you have met folks who do a lot of talking, and they talk a big talk, but when you wait on them to get something done, you may wait a long time. I know that's none of you all, but we know people like that. So prove yourself a doer, it says, not just a talker. Well, how, how do you do that? Well, go back to the football strategy. If you tell me that you are a great quarterback, that you are a great passer, that you're probably the best passer on the team or the best passer in the room, how do you prove it? Well, you get out there and you throw the ball, hit the guy right on the numbers, catch it. When, when, when you do it, especially when you're under pressure and when you're close to getting tackled, and then I'll believe that you are really a great quarterback and a good passer when you prove that you can do it. How do you prove you're a great receiver? Well, you don't watch the ball drop over there. You catch it and you run. You make a touchdown or two as a good receiver, and I'll be- you will prove who you are. You'll prove to be a doer. Same is true of the kitchen with that cookbook. You know, that really is a nice cookbook my mama got me. It's really pretty, nice, bright orange color, hard to, hard to miss. 
But if I looked at the pictures and read the words and didn't do what it says, I'd never cook a very good meal. So if you tell me you're a good cook, I'm going to say, prove it. Fix me something really good. Uh, not not that, it's, you know, that I'm begging for food or nothing, but I like to eat. That's something that I like to do. If you claim the, that you can cook the best, that you can bake the best pie of anybody else in the room, I will believe it when you prove it by baking that pie and giving me a piece. You know, that's, that's not chocolate. Uh, it, it, don't don't bake. I don't know why people put chocolate pudding stuff in a nice nice pie crust. That's just not a good thing to do. Um, so you bake it. You you prove that you're a good cook, and I will believe you. You prove by doing. When the Bible says that we are to prove yourself a doer, it's not just empty words. It's not just saying, "Boy, I know the Bible. I can quote it backwards and forward." The way that you prove it is by doing what it says. So verse 22 tells, tells us not to be merely hearers, but be doers of the word, to do what it says. In fact, did you notice the end of that verse? It says that people who are, who are hearers, not doing, but just hearers, you notice what it says about them? It says that they delude themselves. They are self-deluded. Well, well, what does that mean? It means that they are lying to themselves. You know, it's really not a good thing when you lie to yourself and believe your lies. There are people who actually do that. Not all of them are politicians, but a, a lot of them seem to be. They, they, they believe what they say, whether it's true or whether it's not, and that's on both sides of that fence. It's not a good thing. Uh, and if you... If you are self-deluded, if you're deluding yourself, if you're lying to yourself and believing it, you know, that is one definition of being a fool. And the truth of the matter is many of the translations for this verse don't, don't say they're deluding themselves. It says they're, they're fooling themselves or making fools of themselves. If they say that they believe, if they claim to be believers, if they're hearers but not doers, then they're making a fool of themselves. So prove yourself to be a doer, not just a hearer. That is important. But don't stop with 21 and 22. Did you notice the promise of verse 25? I like verse 25. It says, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, abides by that word. It's not enough to look at it. You've got to abide by it, to live by it. Not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effective doer, an effectual doer. Then do you notice what God says? If you, if you abide by the word, if you effectively do it, then he says that man will be blessed in what he does. How many of you like being blessed? How many of you want God to bless you? Well, here it is. Abide in the word, be an effectual doer, and God will bless what you do. We have God's word on it. Is God's deluded. Is he lying? No. What God says is true. So if you want to be blessed, here's, here's a way to do it. So hear it, learn it, do it. Learn from what Jesus says and do what he says. You don't, you don't want to be a fool. You want to do what he says. You want to be an effectual doer. And in that, you're blessed. You know, I'm reminded of something that, that Jesus says in terms of hearing it, learning it, and doing it. Uh, in, in Luke 6, verse 46, Jesus turned to the folks and he said, Hey, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do the things that I say? If you're not doing what he says, then he's not Lord for you. He is Lord over all. But if you're not doing what he says, he's not your boss. You're not listening to him as Lord. And Jesus says that's important to do. So, in Scripture, are there any examples of folks who who live this James 1 hearer and doer kind of stuff? Do we have an example of someone who hears Jesus, hears what he says, understands what he says, and then makes a choice about whether he's going to be a doer or not? Well, yeah, we've got a good one, as a matter of fact, the rich young ruler. Um, and I, I love the story of the rich young ruler. It is powerful. You'd find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But I'm going to read for you from Mark's gospel, the account of the rich young ruler. It's in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. And as I read this to you, if you have your Bible, you're welcome to follow along. But as I read it to you, listen to, to the 
character into what's happening as he hears, as he understands, and what he does or does not do. Beginning in verse 17, Mark chapter 10. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He says, You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. He said, Teacher, I have kept all these from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said, One thing you lack. Go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But at these words, he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his word, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, With people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. The account of the rich young ruler in Mark's gospel, this this young man comes to Jesus with a question. He comes to Jesus and he says, what, what do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Does he come to the right person for answers, first of all? Yes, comes to the right person because he's coming to Jesus. That's important. Does Jesus take time to respond to him? Yes, Jesus takes time to respond to him. Okay, well then we need to ask some questions. Does, does the rich young ruler hear Jesus? Does he hear what Jesus says? Yep, he hears him. Not only does he hear him, but does he learn what is required if he's to, to... Yeah, he learns what he has to do. Well, you know, that leaves one more question. He hears, he learns, but the key to it all, does he do what Jesus says? No. In fact, it says that he's grieved, he's sad, he walks away sad. He listens to the words of Jesus, and that's important to do. He learns what's needed, and that's important, but he chooses not to do. If we will not do what Jesus says, then all of the listening and all of the learning is wasted. It's vain. If we know all the right things to do but don't do them, if we know what not to do but do it anyway, then all the learning is wasted. We are to learn so that we can do. We learn so that we can live in Jesus. The rich young ruler hears, he goes to the right guy, he hears the right words, he understands what Jesus says, but he says, no, no, uh, he, he walked, instead he walked away from Jesus. You see, he had a lot of land, he had a lot of property, he had a lot of money, and he walked away. He said, man, I can't, I can't put my stuff aside in order to follow Jesus. I can't do that. So he walked away. He walked away sad. He walked away lost. He walked away sad, but he walked away. The truth is, Jesus asks the same thing of each of us. He doesn't say that we have to sell everything that we have, but he says, anything that keeps me from being boss, Lord, in your life, you have to put that aside so that you can come and follow me. Because that's what he said to the rich young ruler. You, you sell the stuff, but then what you do, you come, follow me. Jesus calls each of us to come and follow him. That's what we're supposed to do. Whatever stands in the way of us following Jesus, of us doing what he says, that's what we need to lay aside so that we can follow Jesus. And Jesus says then, come follow me. Now we know some things about following Jesus. Uh, we're all familiar with, or pretty much familiar with Luke 9, 23. And Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, what's he got to do? Well, he's got to deny yourself. You got to take up your cross daily and then you got to come follow me. He says, if you want to come after me, that's what you got to do. It takes sacrifice. It takes denying ourselves and our stuff. It takes a willingness to die to self to follow Jesus. If we do that, if we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus, then we will prove to be doers of the word. We'll prove to be followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus. We'll be doers and not hearers only if we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. So what happens then if... if 
Jesus says, come and follow, follow me, then, then what happens? Well, from our August memory verse in Matthew 11, we know that Jesus says we're supposed to come and we're supposed to learn from him. In verse 28, he says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden and, and burdened, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because he says, I'm gentle and humble in heart, and I'll give you rest for your souls. He says, you got to learn from me. If we're going to come follow Jesus, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to keep learning. You mean, it's like we're still in school? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when is it good enough to stop learning what Jesus wants? <laughs> when you're in heaven, you'll know it all, and you won't need to keep learning. In the meantime... We need to keep learning. If we're not learning, we're not doing what he wants. So to follow Jesus, come and follow Jesus, one of the things we have to do is learn. Of course, that's not all. If you learn what Jesus says, then you also need to obey. Jesus says, come and follow me, obey my word. Several times in Scripture, especially in John's Gospel, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, then you'll do what I say. If you love me, you will obey my word. It's not optional. Obedience is not optional for a Christian. You cannot be a Christ follower if you do not obey. Hear that again. You cannot be a Christ follower if you do not obey. There is no following Jesus without obedience. If you're not doing what he tells you to do, if you're not, then you're not following him. Obedience is not optional for a true follower of Jesus. It is part of what we do if we come and follow him like he says. When we follow Jesus, then, then there's a purpose in it, of course. He says, come and learn to be like me. Our purpose is to be like Jesus. In Luke 6, 40, Jesus says, a student is not above the teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like the teacher. That's our goal, is to be like Jesus, to be like him. The goal from learning and doing is to be like Jesus, to become more like him every day. That's what Christian means, to be little Christ, to be like Jesus. It means that, that we're his disciple, we're his follower, and we learn and we grow and we move toward Christ-likeness every day, becoming more like Jesus all along the way. That's what happens if we come and follow Jesus. Lots of good things happening. Well, what else will happen if we become followers of Jesus and, and not hearers only, but doers? Remember what Jesus says in, in Matthew 4, 19? He tells, tells the, the guys out in the boat, or they're taking care of the nets, he says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. If you follow Jesus, if we really follow Jesus, then we'll strive to bring others to Jesus too. That's part of what we do. We'll, we'll bring folks to Jesus. If you're not fishing for people, if you're not leading people to Jesus, then you're not really following Jesus or doing what he said when he says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Following Jesus leads us to, to share salvation with lost folks. We can't, can't really help it if we're following Jesus. And if we know from James 1, 21, that the word implanted has the power to save souls, then as a Christian, I'm going to want to learn God's word. I'm going to want to learn what it says so I can share it with others so that they can be saved. Jesus says, you follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's about evangelism. But you know, Jesus doesn't want us to stop with evangelism. How many of you remember the Great Commission? You remember what Jesus says in the Great Commission? He says, go and make disciples of all the nation. Well, what are disciples? Disciples are just faithful followers of Jesus, people who follow Jesus. If you are a faithful follower of Jesus, disciples of Jesus make disciples. If you're being a disciple, you'll be making disciples. You'll help lead others to follow Jesus too. Folks, if we come and follow Jesus like he calls us to, then we will be doers of the word and not hearers only deluding ourselves. There is no other way to truly follow Jesus. Come and follow me or be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And it tells me that school is not just for the kids. Jesus is our teacher, and he wants us to listen, and he wants us to learn of him, to hear his word and, and to, to listen. When you hear and, and then listen and, and hear what he says, when you listen to what God says, and when you learn what he wants of you, just like the rich young ruler learned what was required, when you hear it and learn it, 
Well, that's the beginning, but it's not enough to hear and to learn. You got to do it. That's what being a disciple is about, hearing and learning, listening and learning, but then doing it. Knowing the truth is not enough. Believing that it's true is not enough. Satan believes that Jesus is God's son who died on the cross for, for people to be saved. Believing it is not enough. We need to receive his word implanted in us. When it's implanted in us, then we will not be a hearer only, but we will prove ourselves doers of his word. Friend, Jesus is calling, come and follow me. He calls everyone. He says, come and follow. Some will be like the rich young ruler, and they'll hear him and say, you know what? Good idea. I know it's a good thing to do, but no, not for me. Some will even say that they follow, but the proof is in what you do, not just in what you say. Jesus is calling you. If you've not given your life to him, he's calling you saying, come, follow me, come, be saved. I want to give you new life, new hope and forgiveness. If you have accepted Christ as your Savior, then he's saying, come, follow me. Learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Be a doer and not a hearer only. Prove yourself a doer. You know, the question is not whether or not we hear, because we're hearing. You're here. You're hearing right now. It's not just about listening and learning. It's about doing. So my question is to you is, what are you going to do with what Jesus is telling you? Will you give your life to Jesus, become a Christian? As a Christian, will you follow him to go where he leads? Don't be merely a hearer deluding yourself. Prove yourself a doer of God, a doer of his word. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you for your truth to us. Thank you that we can learn, become more knowledgeable, understand more of your word. But Father, help us never to stop there. Never to stop with knowing the right thing to do. Lord, help us to be doers and not hearers only. We don't, we don't want to be fools who, who know but don't do. We don't want to be like the rich young ruler who walked away after hearing the truth. But Father, help us to be not just hearers, but doers, doing what you call us to do. Father, as we come to the end of, of this service, as we come to the response time, Lord, I don't know what you're laying on folks' hearts, there may be some here who say, you know what, I, I've known about Jesus dying on the cross for me, but I've never really given my life to him. It's time for me to do that. Father, if there's one who needs, needs that forgiveness and that hope and that new life, I pray that today would be the day that they'd give themselves to you, yield to you, and, and be saved. And Father, for those who have already professed faith, pray that you'll help us to understand that you don't want us just to be hearers or even learners just to know it all. You want us to be doers. So help us to be effective in doing and so to be blessed by you. Whatever the need, Lord, as we share together, I pray, Lord, that you will lead and that we'll respond to you to be the doer that you call us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.